Good afternoon, I'm Nathan W. Bingham, Ligonier's Director of Digital Outreach, and thank you for joining us for this afternoon's live Google Hangout, Living Faithfully in the New Public Square. Uh, we have two guests joining us this afternoon. Our first guest is a Vice President with the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C., and uh, she, is, she also runs their Institute uh, for Family, Community, and Opportunity. I'm um, speaking of Miss Jennifer Marshall. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you, Nathan. We also have for this afternoon's conversation uh, Dr. Stephen Nichols. He is the president of Reformation Bible College. He is the chief academic officer here at Ligonier Ministries. And he's also the teacher of the weekly podcast, Five Minutes in Church History. Uh, if you don't listen to the podcast, a quick plug, search for it in iTunes or visit fiveminutesinchurchhistory.com. Uh, Dr. Nichols, it's a pleasure to have you with us uh, for this afternoon's conversation. That's great to be here, Nathan. Looking forward to our conversation. Now, Jennifer, um, as I said in the introduction, you work there with the Heritage Foundation uh, in D.C. For those uh, watching live who may be not familiar or less familiar with Heritage, you just give us a little bit of background on the Heritage Foundation. Who are they? What's their uh, mission? And then specifically, just focus on the Institute uh, for Family, uh, Community, and Opportunity that you run there. Happy to. The Heritage Foundation has been around for more than 40 years. We're a public policy think tank dedicated to informing leaders at the national level about public policy issues that they're dealing with. So we're dealing with members of Congress, uh, federal agency members, and we're specifically dedicated to advancing free market economics, a strong national defense, and traditional American values. And it's that latter part where my Institute for Family, Community, and Opportunity comes in. And in this institute, we're dealing with issues like health care and education and welfare, marriage, life, and religious liberty, and then the constitutional principles that are the grounding for our uh, Republican order here in the United States. And these are the areas, when you think about health care and education and welfare, these are the areas that are about our most basic human needs, and our, our government has become very deeply entwined in Americans' daily lives in these areas. So we're trying to uh, address how we can do better, how we can think more about these permanent and fundamental institutions of family, of religious congregations, of these associations, all the ways that we network in what's called civil society, in the sociological political philosophy parlance. These are the ways that we get together and we solve problems and we address needs, and yet we've seen an erosion of these areas of our society in recent decades. We're trying to, and at the Heritage Foundation, particularly in this institute, we're dedicated to trying to rebuild the strength of these most basic institutions, and in uh, to do it, by doing so, to be able to bring government back to its proper roles as well, uh, rather than becoming. Uh, rather than uh, getting to the scenarios that we see so often today where people are deeply dependent on government and that is inhibiting their ability to thrive uh, and, and the family's ability to, to flourish, religious congregations' opportunity to, uh, to do their best work in society. Is this emphasis on the family and this institute, is this, is this a new focus for heritage? Well, the Institute itself is about a year and a half old, and we, we launched three institutes, the Institute for Family, Community, and Opportunity, Institute for National Security, and Institute for Economic Freedom. We did so because these are the major arenas of public policy. We wanted to show our in, uh, at work and effort in each of those realms, but this was really expressing something that had gone on for, for the decades before at the Heritage Foundation as well, something that was assumed in our efforts to pursue limited government in a strong market economy. That is that you need the strength of the family, you need the strength of these community institutions and associations if you're going to have limited government, if you're going to have a free market economy. So this brought it out more uh, vividly. Uh, about a decade ago we actually had founded the DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society to talk about the good of religious practice for a free society and why, why we need thriving religious congregations if we're going to be a self-governing people. Now, in addition to your work there at Heritage, you also uh, work with Reformed Theological Seminary, uh, and you have an institute there, the Institute of Theology and Public Life. Could you tell us a little bit about that? 
Absolutely. I'm very pleased to be working with Reformed Theological Seminary and to help launch this Institute of Theology and Public Life. I'm a graduate of, of RTS at the DC campus, and it, during our time uh, discoursing with the, the faculty there, we realized, you know, there's more that we can do to serve the Washington, DC community by applying our Reformed theological learning and, and bringing it to bear more on the vocational specializations that are characteristic of the Washington, D.C. environment. And so we have created a series of classes and uh, a program of study that people can pursue, whether they are pastors preparing to lead a congregation in which there may be a number of people who are in public policy careers, or if they are simply public policy practitioners who are interested in coming and doing theological study, much like I myself did at, at RTS. And one of the things we try to do in the foundational courses of the Institute of Theology and Public Life at RTSDC is to help enlarge the understanding of what the public square is all about, what politics is all about. You know, if we, if we stopped a uh, person on the street and said, what is politics, they'd probably think about this horse race of electoral politics that we're involved in this year, or the, the kind of food fights that go on on cable news sometimes. And yet what politics is about is much more vast than that. It's really about how do we order and organize our lives together in a community, in society. And if that's the question, well, that suddenly enlarges the conversation to be very broad and something we need to think about the institutions of family, the institution of church. We need to think about the roles of all the kinds of associations I've been talking about. There are many, many different actors in society who are thinking about and, and participating in this ordering of life together. And as Christians, we need to particularly think about what the Bible has to say about that, what God has to say about how we should arrange our lives on this earth. That makes us go back to very basic questions. What's the purpose of human life? What, what's the end of human existence? And how should we be thinking about conveying that to others? So you've got to start with issues like, what is the creation all about? What are, what are the norms that were just written into the very character of creation? What does it mean for the human beings to be made in the image of God? Uh, it means some very profound being relational, that we're created to be in relationship with one another after the model of the triune God, and that we're that work in design and, and patterning our efforts after the, the efforts of our Creator, the work of our Creator, that has implic the, the, those implications come to bear on public policy and on politics because of the fact that human beings are made in the image of God. And then we could go through so many other things about institutional roles and responsibilities, but it this, this disposition, the, the, the kind of perspective that I'm describing here, makes it incumbent, incumbent on, on us all to be thinking about our role of stewarding our life together in society. Now, it might seem obvious uh, to those that are watching and that we've invited you here to be our guest, but as you've touched on, you are a Christian. Uh, I'm wondering if, if it's not too personal to ask, but would you mind just sharing a little bit about your Christian background and, and how you came to know the Lord? I had the wonderful joy of being born in a Christian home and being raised as a Christian such that I do not remember a time when I did not believe the truth of the scripture, and the truth that Christ is my Lord and Savior. And I was uh, very uh, blessed to be able to attend Christian schools. Uh, and my dad was a uh, medical doctor at, for a short time on the mission field. And we were in Taiwan for two years when, when I was a child. I started kindergarten and first grade there. So just had a profound opportunity to understand what missions is all about, what service is about. I was grew up in an Orthodox Presbyterian church congregation in Wheaton, Illinois, where there was a just a rich uh, body of Christ there engaged in all types of service uh, for all kinds of needs, what was foster care, or helping refugees, and, uh, and and then also the arts. It was We had a number of Wheaton College professors and engaged in literature and arts and humanities there, so it made it... Um, a, it, gave, it imparted to me and raised me in a, in a worldview that was very rich with understanding that our faith touches all of life and should be lived out, has implications for all these arenas and all these callings in, in, our, in the world around us. How has your faith 
uh, impacted or influenced the work that you're doing there uh, in Washington, D.C.? Well, I think one thing it does is to make me think uh, deeply about the diagnosis of what's going on around us. So often the kinds of policy discussions that we have here in Washington are reduced to material concerns. And as Christians, we know that human beings are not merely material beings. We are, we are in relation to a transcendent God, and we are relational beings in, in our human community. And that's, so, so thinking more uh, deeply about the nature of the problem uh, and then how we can bring uh, the, the understanding of the way that God has made the world for its flourishing, how we can bring that understanding to bear on a question. I'll give an example. Uh, I think quite a bit and wor have worked for a number of years on issues related to poverty and welfare. And the way we've gone about fighting poverty over the last 50 years in the war on poverty has really been that predominantly materialistic definition of what's at issue. That if we could simply get enough resources into an individual's hands and into a household's uh, environment, then we could, then that would be fighting poverty and overcoming poverty. Unfortunately, that, that kind of a solution, that kind of an approach has proven to be very ineffective over the last half century, such that the poverty rate we have today is just about the same as it was when the war on poverty started in 1965. And yet what we see having dramatically increased is family breakdown. And so where you had single digit unwed childbearing in the 1960s, today more than 40% of children are born outside of marriage, born to a single mother. That has a dramatic effect on the course of a child's life. And we need to be realistic about how we're going to meet those challenges, not just in a remedial way, but in trying ultimately to get back to restoring the institution of marriage and helping and strengthening family founded and grounded on marriage. In order to do that, we need to make sure that the welfare state is not creating disincentives to marriage. We're not having marriage, we need to make sure that we're not having marriage penalties in the welfare state. And we need to make sure that the welfare system does not undermine work. We know that work is essential to human dignity because of human beings being made in the image of God. Therefore, any public assistance needs to make sure it is encouraging work, it is encouraging that attribute of human nature made in the image of God. That's one example of how my diagnosis would, of, of the problem and my application of the solution would be influenced by my Christian faith. Well, Dr. Nichols, I just want to bring you in here, and you, you, you're serving in a slightly different role, uh, where we have Jennifer uh, exercising her faith and, and serving there in Capitol Hill. You're serving to prepare young people who are, you know, taking those preparatory steps to then go out into this new public square. How does the environment of today and how does uh, your understanding of, of the 21st century influence or impact how uh, RBC teaches students and maybe even specifically how it influences your classroom when you have students with you? Well, first, I just need to say a word of just gratitude to Jennifer. Uh, I. I was uh, one of those professors of her up at uh, DC at RTS for a number of years. I was able to adjunct there and just thoroughly enjoyed being there. And when she told me about uh, this institute, I thought that was just a wonderful idea. And for her and Dr. Scott Redd, uh, the president up there, kicking that off. Uh, and even uh, Chris Larson here at Ligonier, he and I had an opportunity to go up, meet with Jennifer there in her offices at Heritage, and just impressed upon literally how close Heritage is to the Capitol. You can see the dome right outside their windows, but just to know that there are folks there who care very deeply about these issues, who are theologically trained, who are... Uh, in the church and in God's word and bringing all that to bear on public policy and influencing public policy. So uh, just to underscore uh, some of the things that Jennifer said, just very grateful for her and for the work there. In terms of listening to her and thinking in terms of her own pilgrimage and the value of a theological education for the work she does, I just find all that just energizes me all the more uh, for what we're doing here. If we think, as, as Jennifer so eloquently put it, 
in terms of these issues that we're dealing with, fundamentally, these are biblical theological issues. We're talking about the nature of human beings, the nature of human identity, who God is as creator, issues of common grace and natural law, and all of these, we find these, even in just the early chapters of Genesis, we find significant biblical data to help us understand how to order and organize and bring our lives together. So I think you cannot, uh, you couldn't overestimate the value of a theological education, no matter what field you go into as a vocation. The other thing is that as we think about a biblical education or theological education, we're also thinking in terms of the good, the true, and the beautiful. And so scripture has much to say about all of those categories. You read of God's heart in scripture, you find that the good, the true, and the beautiful just flow over the pages of the text. Uh, Dr. Stroll, our founder of the college here, founder of Ligonier Ministries, our chancellor, uh, he has said it many times, grounding students in the good, the true, and the beautiful is the best way to prepare them for their work to come and for the decades to come. So we take that charge very seriously. Uh, I take that obligation very seriously as president, that that defines who we are, and it works its way into the curriculum. And as we graduate students and they leave here, I would love to see us uh, graduate all sorts of students, just like Jennifer uh, and her work uh, there at Heritage. Uh, we'd be very pleased uh, with that as a result. Steve, when you say the good, the true, and the beautiful, I'm sure people watching are nodding their head when we say good and true. But they may scratch their head when you say the beautiful. Would you mind just briefly, what are some of the ways that the beautiful is reflected in the curriculum and the experience of Reformation Bible College. You know, it's really funny you should mention that, Nathan. I joke sometimes uh, with my students about, you know, good, true, and the beautiful. You take that back to Plato. This is the roots of Greek philosophy, the, the pillars, as it were, of the Western tradition. You look at that statement, good, true, and beautiful. You have um, a very similar statement by our American superhero, Superman, who is about truth, justice, and instead of the beautiful, he says the American way. So I always find it interesting that for some reason, especially in modern 21st century American culture, we have real difficulty with the category of beauty. Partly, we don't understand it philosophically. We sort of reduced it to prettiness and ugliness, or we reduced it to preference. You know, you like chocolate ice cream, I like vanilla, you like Beethoven, I like Pop 40. Um, we've reduced the category of the aesthetic to a category of preference. Now you go through scripture and you're going to find truth, you're going to find justice and goodness, you're also going to find beauty. You know, I was just looking at this and I think it's a chapter that can help us. It's Psalm 27, it's a beautiful chapter. David's talking about, you know, the enemies are surrounding me, they're assailing me. Uh, I feel like my feet, you know, is knocked out from under me. Some of the things we're going to get into here in a little bit in terms of just what we're facing with in the political moment in this new public square. David says, this one thing I long for, to dwell in the house of the Lord and to gaze upon his beauty. So I think as Christians, we can't just say absolute ethic absolute truth, beauty is up for grabs. I think we do owe it uh, to ourselves and to the next generation to talk about aesthetics and to talk about beauty. Well, Jennifer, uh, when you analyze uh, our current culture and you consider the Christian life and worldview, uh, where are you seeing these two worldviews colliding today? What is, uh, from your vantage point, the, the central issue of our day. Well, Steve just mentioned the first couple of chapters of Genesis, and I think beginning there, the Christian conf the confession is very distinct. We confess that human beings are made in the image of God, male and female, made for each other in marriage and in community. And you have about a half dozen 
contact points that are going to have increasing friction associated with them if they don't already right in those couple of chapters it is we are having some basic challenges of anthropology Christian anthropology and understanding the nature of what it means to be human is going to be extraordinarily important for the coming decade and, and probably for decades to come. We need to be clearly uh, forming young people to understand what the Christian confession says with regard to human nature and the purpose of human beings, the nature of community, what it means to be made in relation to the opposite sex, why that matters, how we're going to organize society. You know, we're even seeing these conflicts we're going to get to later in the, the uh, conversation here that come very close to home when it, uh, uh, concerning these basic, basic truths of Christian anthropology. So you start there, but working your way out through all of Scripture, I think there are just so many aspects of the Christian confession that are going to be challenged, and that calls on us in new ways to be able to not only know what we believe, but to be able to articulate it in a way that connects and is in a way that makes it possible to have a conversation with people who are coming from very different presuppositions and very different uh, ideas about the purpose of human life. Uh, we're dealing with ideas of radical autonomy and that the purpose of human life can be whatever one dreams it up to be, uh, rather than an understanding that we are made in relation to our Creator and He has determined the nature and purpose of human beings. So these are all, um, there, are, there are 101 applications of those ideas in our public square today and in our public discourse. Knowing the truth and being able to articulate that in ways that it, uh, contribute to a, a a healthy and constructive public discourse, I think, are the enormous challenges for us in our time. Well, I know that for many Christians, uh, it, it feels like a very overwhelming time. Even if uh, you know they're not extremely politically literate, on their commute to and from work, on the evening news, it seems that every day there is a new headline touching on some of these areas. Um, I'm just wondering if you're willing maybe to have a little bit of a lightning round where I might bring up uh, some of the issues that I'm sure those watching live are somewhat familiar with or have heard in the headlines. And maybe you could just help distill and briefly explain what is the issue there, how should Christians think about it, maybe what should be our response or what could the consequences be. Are you willing for some kind of lightning round like that? Absolutely, and I'll try to, I'll try to be lightning about it. <laughs> okay, if you need to uh, give a bit more detail and explanation, that's totally fine. Um, but one is uh, the Little Sisters of the uh, Poor Home for the Aged. Uh, I know there's connections there with Hobby Lobby, uh, and this, this case is, is ongoing right now. Could you just help us understand what's, what's the issue there, what's at stake? Sure. At the Heritage Foundation and the Institute for Family, Community, and Opportunity, we're very committed to protecting religious liberty. And that's religious liberty not only for churches and worship proper, but also religious expression of service through, through non religious nonprofits, Christian education, the kinds of uh, uh, ministries and charities that we see uh, making such a vibrant civil society here in the United States. And then finally, the third category of religious protection that is needed when we're talking about robust religious freedom is for individual Christians in their callings and in their daily work. And what you saw in the Hobby Lobby case was that third category. Can a family go into business and run their business according to their beliefs, their basic Christian faith? Uh, and the, the Green family that owns Hobby Lobby and has since the beginning and of their corporate documents and all their board dealings been very, very clear that the purpose of their uh, their uh, company is for religious purposes and, guide, and guided by religious principle. They had a conflict when the Obama administration's uh, bureauc bureaucracy at the Health and Human Services Department said that as a as a matter of the new Obamacare health care law, all, nearly all insurance plans in the country would have to cover contraception and abortion inducing drugs. Well, the Green family had a problem with their employee coverage for health care 
covering abortion-inducing drugs. It was against their beliefs. And so they, uh, they un we were unable to get the Obama administration to make any kind of accommodation in this situation. And as a result, the Green family and many others went to court to protect their religious liberty. Well, that case, as you know, made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court decided in favor of the Green family and in favor of Americans being able to exercise their faith in the context of a family business. Now we see the same policy, the Obama administration requiring contraception coverage, being in conflict with a religious nonprofit's employee health coverage. In this case, it's an even more empathetic plaintiff in that it's the Little Sisters of the Poor. This is a group of nuns who have dedicated their lives to helping the indigent elderly, caring for them in their last days. And they're a group of nuns. They are unmarried. Uh, they have vows of chastity. And the Obama administration is requiring them to cover uh, contraception in their employer uh, health plans. Uh, this is absurd. And the Little Sisters should not have got, had to go to court to protect their religious liberty. It certainly should not have made it all the way to the Supreme Court, but it was, in fact, heard by the Supreme Court back in March. Um, I was on the steps of the Supreme Court that day, and there were many nuns there, as well as actually other, um, other plaintiffs, including Geneva College and some other religious organizations who are a part of this case that represents a number of plaintiffs. We expect that we will hear in, at the end of June about that, and it is the, 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 the mechanism that the court is using to consider the religious liberty claims of the nuns and the other uh, religious plaintiffs is called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which basically says, it was a law, by the way, passed almost unanimously by Congress in the 1990s. Uh, nothing passes unanimously except naming post offices, by the way. And it was signed by President Bill Clinton. So it's, this is a long-standing religious freedom law, and un, it, it requires that if there is a generally applicable law which happens to burden religious free exercise, then the government has to show that it has a compelling interest to do so. In this case, the government is saying that it's a compelling interest uh, to deliver free access for, the, for all women to contraception. And that it has, the other thing the government has to prove is that it has delivered that, it has pursued that compelling interest through the least restrictive means. And in this case, it is very hard to see that the government could possibly say and prove that it was the least restrictive means to get free contraception to all American women by ordering these nuns to violate their conscience and the other religious organizations that are out there. That is a really helpful summary. Thank you. Um, you nailed that one on the head. I appreciate it. Um, uh, let me just, for this, the second one in this lightning round, let me just open it a little bit and just uh, ask you, maybe you could speak on uh, what the Congress is doing right now in regards to religious liberty, if there's, if there's anything you want to speak to. Yeah, this is very important, what Congress is doing on religious freedom, since particularly the Supreme Court decision last year to mandate that government at the federal level and at the state level recognize same-sex marriage. Now, that Supreme Court decision forced government to change its definition of marriage, but there was nothing in that decision that forces individual citizens or organizations, particularly religious organizations, to change our convictions about marriage. Nothing in that decision compels us to do so. Nor does anything in that decision give the government the authority to compel us to change our convictions about marriage. <clears throat> and so it's been very important, and we've made it a priority, to seek policy at the federal and the state level that would protect Americans' freedom to speak and to act consistent with the truth about marriage, and to make sure that government does not uh, coerce uh, the organizations, religious organizations and others, and individuals who believe that marriage is the union of one man and one woman, or who believe that sexual relations ought to be reserved for marriage, uh, the government may not compel organizations against their convictions in those, in those situations. And so there's uh, been legislation introduced, which is now picking up steam, called the First Amendment Defense Act which would prohibit exactly what I've just articulated. It would make sure that the federal government does not 
uh, revoke the tax exempt status of an organization that believes in marriage as the union of a man and a woman, or that the government cannot re cannot uh, will not recognize accreditation bodies who disregard the religious liberty of uh, bodies like uh, Reformation or Gordon College or some of these others that have been uh, Gordon College in particular has had its accreditation body breathing down its neck with regard to its views of marriage and sexuality. Uh, government should not be able to coerce private organizations with regard to their views of marriage. The First Amendment Defense Act would prohibit that uh, wherever the federal government has contact points with individuals and institutions. Um, in 2014, so it's a couple of years ago now, uh, the mayor of Houston, uh, she began issuing subpoenas, if I understand this correctly, uh, wanting to get transcripts of church's sermons just so she could uh, determine if there was any hate speech in there. Uh, now, she received a lot of backlash in doing that, and those subpoenas were withdrawn. Um, do you have any insight into that particular incident? Has anything like that happened since? Uh, and if not, do you think that you know the church uh, in 2016 is is trending that we we may begin to face uh, issues like that in the near future? This incident in Houston is a really important wake-up call for everyone to be concerned about the status of religious liberty in our country. Even if we're not personally feeling the heat yet, we should all be learning about what the challenges are, such as this kind of a conversation does, and making sure that we're doing what we can uh, to talk with our friends and neighbors and families about this and stand up as citizens to protect religious freedom right now. The background in the case of Houston and the mayor issuing subpoenas for these pastor's sermons was that there had been a sexual orientation gender identity uh, ordinance passed by the city council there in Houston. And w one thing that did was to allow bathroom access to those claiming uh, to identify with the other sex or transgender individuals. This was very concerning, naturally, to the citizens of Houston. Uh, they were concerned for the the security, particularly of young women, girls, uh, who might encounter situations in the bathroom there who, where people might exploit uh, the, the opening uh, and, and use this kind of an ordinance uh, for negative purposes. So the citizens rose up and, and uh, actually had a ballot opportunity, an opportunity on the ballot to reverse that ordinance of the city council. And pastors and others were speaking about it, speaking about some of the issues with regard to understanding of sex and gender uh, in their churches. And that's what precipitated the mayor asking for the sermons. Uh, and it, it, that that uh, puts a climate of intimidation, certainly, over our exercise, our free exercise of religion uh, in the context of religious congregations. And it sends a message that somehow political officials are in a position to be able to uh, monitor what is said from the pulpit. And that's uh, not, not a right, consistent uh, posture with regard to the First Amendment of this country, of the Constitution of this country. Uh, so it's something we need to s speak up and say, call it out for that. Unfortunately, we have seen another case of government officials checking into sermons and monitoring their content, and it came to a more negative outcome. And that's just recently the case of Dr. Eric Walsh, who was hired by, uh, in, in Georgia to uh, be a public health official there. He had also preached in a Seventh-day Adventist uh, congregation that he is a part of, some sermons that are orthodox with regard to sexuality, um, uh, Islam, evolution. He preached on some of these topics that are um, debated in our public square today, but he had done so in, in consistent with his faith. And when, those, when the department uh, in Georgia went out and found these sermons and monitored them and found that they were... Uh, not in keeping with the politically correct views, apparently, of that department, they uh, retracted his uh, contract and, and, and fired him. That is a case that is, has just now it, uh, been announced, and that will go to court. But it is very concerning that public officials would uh, think that they have the right to monitor and regulate what can be said uh, in, in uh, churches and that they can somehow use that in the context of hiring uh, for a public official's job, which is uh, not, uh, not permitted under uh, federal law under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Another area where it seems every day if I open up Twitter I'm 
I'm hearing of a, a, a new celebrity that's saying they're not going to go to North Carolina or Mississippi, they're canceling a concert or, or whatever in regards to the bills there, what, what the media are calling gay hatred bills or pro-discrimination bills. Um, could you just speak to that a little bit, if you would? You know, it's just so um, surprising to see claims that these bills in North Carolina and Mississippi are offering a license to discriminate or that we're seeing religious liberty in the scare quotes that this so-called religious liberty. The license to discriminate charge has it exactly backwards. The, the, what these laws are doing, and I'll talk about the Mississippi case in particular, which is a religious liberty bill, is it prohibits government from discriminating against religious individuals in uh, individuals who might have a difference of opinion from that of the, the uh, Supreme Court enforced understanding of marriage. So it's prohibiting government from discriminating against these groups and individuals. And the very vague assertions uh, that we're seeing negatively in the press about these laws uh, actually doesn't have any bearing on the actual text. In Mississippi, what this law does is to protect very specific cases of uh, individuals who have a uh, con who, who believe that marriage is the union of a man and a woman, it protects them in very particular cases. So you recall the, the crisis that uh, emerged in Kentucky with Kim Davis, the clerk who did not want to issue same-sex marriage licenses. The Mississippi law actually uh, will, will prevent that kind of a of a, of a uh, controversy from erupting and heads it off at the pass because it, it guarantees that anyone who's entitled to a marriage license in that state will get them and it, in a timely fashion, but it also allows for individual clerks to opt out of issuing marriage licenses if they have a conscientious objection. Uh, this also protects, the Mississippi law also protects religious institutions, religious organizations like Christian schools who want to maintain uh, their understanding of uh, marriage in their employee conduct standards and it will protect uh, the the right of uh, wedding vendors who are involved in creating or using their artistic talents to uh, be celebrating a wedding they can decline and refer a same-sex couple to another vendor if they do not if they have a conscience issue with providing and celebrating a same-sex marriage so the, the confusion, I think, in the case of Mississippi has emerged because mainstream media outlets have suggested that the kinds of religious protections that are provided for religious nonprofits are actually uh, applied to uh, businesses, and that's not the case. Uh, the only broad, ex broad uh, protection that the Mississippi law affords to businesses is the right to determine their own bathroom policy. It, it allows them to do what they've always done and have bathrooms that are assigned by biological sex. That's what the new North Carolina bill did, just to uh, just to uh, maintain the status quo and to say we're going to determine bathrooms in this state according to uh, biological sex. The North Carolina law allows private organizations to determine their own bathroom policy. It doesn't dictate what they need to do. And actually the North Carolina law was correcting what the city of Charlotte had done in trying to force private organizations in a different direction than, than the status quo. This is the, the, the uh, absurd level of backlash that we're seeing is really uh, very contrary to under our understanding of what we, uh, how we do public life in America. You know, pay, excuse me, PayPal, for instance, in this in North Carolina, uh, decided that it was not going to expand uh, as it had as apparently planned to do in the state, and the. PayPal has been free to determine their own bathroom policy. They remain free to determine their own bathroom policy. Now they say they've got a conscientious problem with, uh, their, with, with the state of North Carolina. That's their right. They can determine that they want to do that. But shouldn't they also be standing up then for the small business that the florist and the baker who have a conscientious objection to celebrating a same-sex marriage. There's a lot of hypocrisy and double standards going on here and we need to explain that. Well, I'm going to bring the lightning round to a close, but thank you. Um, I'm confident that has you know, brought some clarity to those that are watching that have seen these headlines but just not understanding exactly uh, what, the, what the issues are and you know, it can just be hard to weed through some of the sensational headlines and 
you know, columns and articles that are written on these subjects. Uh, Steve, I want to come to you, but just, just before I do, uh, Jennifer, for, for those that might be watching that uh, are hearing us talk about politics and policy and their, their perspective or viewpoint is that, you know, the church and Christians should be focused on the gospel, focused on, on evangelism. Uh, we should be in the uh, business of trying by God's grace to change hearts and not policy. What, what would you say to someone that, that holds a view like that? If we believe that God transforms hearts and lives, then we have to believe also that God transforms culture and society. Uh, and that he does that through the transformation of our individual lives, but also in the ways that we understand better through the lens of Scripture what the purpose of a family is, what the purpose of the church is, what, what the purpose of government is. And so as we use Scripture and God's teaching to illuminate these questions that we have about our public life together, that has a society-changing effect. And I, I think that the more that we can renew our minds, uh, through this kind of reflection on scripture, through this kind of reflection uh, and interaction with people from different callings who are discerning how to apply uh, God's will in those areas, I think uh, the more we will see the transformation of culture in a way that helps people flourish and uh, brings glory to God. And that ultimately uh, is what this is all about. Well, Steve, as our church historian, uh, and a, a theologian and a teacher there at Reformation Bible College. Uh, what do you see as the relationship between the church and the state? Hmm. No, I, I'd go back to Paul first. I think we got to start there. And Jennifer mentioned renewing our minds. So, you know, we go back to Romans 12, and then we go from Romans 12 into Romans 13, we, and we find plenty of material there that helps us how to navigate our lives as citizens and how we respond as citizens and the legitimacy of the state and also outlining what is in term uh, what is the state's boundaries and role. If we look through the pages of church history, I, I think we can also find significant resources to help us. It was very interesting that at the end of Calvin's Institutes, and uh, Calvin has four books in his Institutes, so it's uh, God is the subject of the first book, and then he turns to Christ, and then it's the Holy Spirit, and then the fourth book is the church. And uh, in some ways, he was just sort of a following an Apostles Creed pattern there, lining that out. But it's in the last book, and the very last chapter is on the church and state. And uh, I think it's a very helpful chapter. And Calvin sketches out there that we as Christians do have something at stake in a civil society and exactly what heritage is interested in and as a think tank there and the scholars they have working there and the work they are doing there in terms of an ordered civil society. Uh, Calvin says we have something at stake in that. Uh, I think about one of my own uh, heroes, Edwards, and uh, Edwards wrote an ethics book called The Nature of True Virtue. And sometimes, and maybe some people have said this, maybe they've said it well-intentioned, uh, you can't legislate morality, right? And I've heard that said. Uh, Edwards would disagree with that. Uh, what Edwards does in that book is he makes a distinction between true virtue and common morality. And he argues that true virtue is ultimately what re regenerate people do. Uh, we need the Holy Spirit who brings our our dead spiritual selves to life and enables us to live a life that is pleasing to God. And in that, having been justified and being in union with Christ, then we can obey God's law and live a life that is pleasing to Him. Edwards calls that true virtue. But then he says, hold on, there's also common morality. And Paul Ramsey, the great Princeton scholar of Edwards, has this wonderful line where he says, common morality is a rather splendid thing in the hands of Edwards. And so we need to promote the very things that, that Jennifer's talking about. We need to promote uh, loving relationships within a family. That's a good thing. And we have something at stake in that. And we have something to say to that. Um, 
Edwards uses the word approbation and reprobation. And when we see approbation behaviors, behaviors that are in keeping with God's law and natural law and God's design for relationships, we have something at stake there. Uh, one of Edwards' friends was Governor Belcher. Uh, Belcher was governor of Massachusetts and then moved down to New Jersey and also for a time served as governor of the colony of New Jersey. And uh, there's wonderful letters passed between Edwards and Belcher. And it, it showed that Edwards as a theologian, churchman, pastor, a, he was a pastor, had an interest in ethics and public policy and had an interest in things that were happening in the Massachusetts State House uh, while he was there in Northampton at Stockbridge. Um, Indian relations and what that meant about human dignity and how Indians should be treated. Seven years Edwards was at Stockbridge, he had a lot to say about this thing. So you know, we have some resources at our disposal. We have resources in the other direction uh, in terms of challenging the state when it oversteps its bounds. Uh, we can go back to Machen and here's Machen, president of Princeton, uh, president rather of Westminster Theological Seminary having left Princeton and he's in Washington DC testifying before the United States Congress encouraging Congress not to start the Department of Education. At that point it was a bureau and as a bureau he was seeing it already being rather intrusive and as a department he just saw this was going to be an entirely intrusive entity that would usurp the authority of the parents and the education of the children. So here he is testifying before Congress as to why there should not be a Department of Education. So we have plenty of examples of churchmen, of committed theologians who also understood that we have something at stake and when we see these kinds of things happening and I'm so grateful that Jennifer's on our side and I hear her run down that litany of things and just uh, hear the response to those things. I, I'm grateful for her. Uh, we, we have something at stake in these things. We, I, I truly believe we do as a church and uh, as a people uh, uh, who, are, who are following God and, and disciples of Christ. Well, I think uh, it's, it's going to be helpful to mention to those watching live, after this Google Hangout is over, uh, be sure to visit ligonier.org slash church and state, one word, church and state. Uh, Dr. Sproul has a free ebook that deals with uh, this particular question of the, the relationship between the church and state. Uh, and if you go there, you'll also find a link to find more than 20 other free ebooks from RC Sprawl. But that's ligonier.org slash church and state. Uh, Steve, uh, we have titled this afternoon's conversation uh, Living Faithfully in the New Public Square. So we have assumed in the title of that that the public square is, is new. Um, what is new about today's public square? Well, you know, one of the words that Jennifer used to describe some of the things that are happening was the word absurd. If you were to go back, let's even just go back to 2010, like in the course of American history, let's just back up six years. Suppose six years ago we said that we were going to be having conversations about bathrooms and uh, there would actually be uh, universities that would dedicate significant resources and even a whole year of discussion to figuring out how to have bathrooms on their campus. Um, I think if someone were to say that in 2010, somebody would stand up and say, you're nuts, that's never going to happen. Here we are and we are having this conversation about bathrooms. I think, honestly, I think it's absurd. And so I think there is a newness. There's a almost, I've spoken of it as almost a cultural whiplash um, in terms of the Supreme Court decision uh, back in the summer uh, regarding same-sex marriage, that there has been a very significant turning of the tide of not just legislation, also in some pockets, public opinion on issues, and the rapidity of it is overwhelming. Uh, that would be my take on what is new about the new public square. Well, uh, you know, I moved here with my family in early 2012. As an Australian, I feel like an outsider looking in. Uh, I've been trying to learn a new system of government and learn a new country and culture. 
Uh, but I sort of feel it's at a disadvantage because it seems that the target keeps moving. Because since getting here, the, the, the state, the status quo hasn't stayed the same. Uh, it keeps changing. Every you know day is a new headline. Um, and so it's, it's made it a great challenge in trying to uh, understand this new land that my family are, are living and serving in. Uh, but, but Jennifer, um, I, I just I want to raise the issue with you of, of clarity. Um, when we are faced with absurd things like these conversations uh, about bathrooms, it does serve uh, to bring clarity to help us understand where our convictions are. How, how is Heritage going in, in trying to bring clarity and help and equip uh, ministries, churches, nonprofits to understand you know, what they believe or, or what the current situation is, is, is about? We think of these uh, challenges on two levels. Number one, they're public policy challenges, and we need to have the right policy in order to exercise our religious freedom and to uh, be able to flourish in our communities of faith and as individuals. And, and we need to uh, have the freedom to, to interact with people who have differences of opinion about those things and be able to persuade and draw, uh, try, to, try to achieve consensus. And that's really what we're interested in in this dialogue. It can seem like a zero-sum game and a winner-take-all. We don't believe that it needs to be that way. We think we, it, we have the tools in our constitutional order to be able to live and let live. To, and, and this is the time when tolerance will really be put to the test. So there are there are public policy uh, resources that we try to provide at heritage.org. Um, you can uh, access a variety of our papers on religious freedom, on the First Amendment Defense Act that I mentioned. Uh, one of the things that we're writing about as well is the new challenge to religious liberty posed by sexual orientation and gender identity policy. Uh, and you can read my colleague Ryan, Ryan Anderson's work on that uh, that explains more uh, what the challenge is there and why it is uh, in, in some conflict with religious liberty. And then uh, we also want to think about this in addition to the level of public policy at the institutional level and do whatever we can to be able to equip religious organizations and churches to operate at a local level and be as best equipped as possible to uh, deal with all the kinds of uh, challenges that are coming up. And so we asked a religious liberty attorney to prepare a report for us that would help ministries go through a kind of inventory. First of all, to be able to articulate what they actually believe. And this, the clarity question is a good one to prompt this conversation because what really needs to take place now, sometimes it's not until the challenge arises that the church realizes it needs to go back and very clearly articulate what it believes on a particular aspect of theology. And in this generation, we're going to be asked to do that with regard to anthropology, what it means to be human. So the very first order of business is that churches and religious ministries need to be clear on what they confess with regard to these issues of marriage and sexuality and relationships. And to then be confident that they are expressing that well in their documents, their policies for employees, for volunteers, for interacting with people who may enter, um, enter whatever programs they, they offer, and work that out through all, all their documents. Then they need to take an inventory of the challenges that are particular to their surroundings. There are municipal, local level uh, policies, state policies, and federal policies that may apply. So be sure to be reaching out to organizations who are following those different levels of policy development. And then finally, depending on the type of organization, there may be religious liberty exemptions that apply that can help navigate around some of those collision areas, those areas of friction. So this report is available on our website. It's by Eric Niffin, K-N-I-F-F-I-N, -F -F -I and I can share it with you to be able to be distributed to your folks. But it's called Protecting the Freedom to Serve, and it walks an organization board through that kind of uh, reflection on its own beliefs and how well those beliefs are expressed in the documents uh, that it's, it, it's put forward. And these can all be found on heritage.org? Heritage.org. And in fact, you can take the, we've, we've assembled some of these resources on a landing page, heritage.org slash free to serve. Heritage.org slash free to serve. Thank you so much. Steve, can you maybe expand a little bit more on the theological 
uh, side, theological clarity, just determining what, what is our foundation as Christians as we uh, you know, go out into this, this new public square. I think it goes back to some of the things we've said already. We need to go back to those opening chapters of Genesis. We need to see that human beings are created in the image of God. We need to see that God created male and female. That certainly speaks into this area of gender confusion. And then we need to see that God's ordained plan for marriage is between a man and a woman. And of course that speaks to these issues of same-sex marriage. So these are the foundational, these are part of the creation order as God, and I would, I really appreciated that Jennifer threw in the idea of work and the dignity of work. We find that in these opening chapters of Genesis. So these are so foundational, and I think as we focus on those, they will bring some clarity to what it means to live as a Christian in this new public square and in this culture. Of course, we need to keep reading uh, past Genesis 1 to 3, uh, but those, it's remarkable to me how you look at what's happening today, the things we've been talking about here, here uh, today, this hour together, uh, they're really answered right there in those opening chapters of Genesis. Well, as we begin to wind up the conversation, we're almost coming on an hour. I just want to throw out a, a question to both of you. I'm going to begin uh, with you, Jennifer. But in light of everything that we have discussed, should Christians feel optimistic right now in the middle of 2016? Absolutely. We have a, a wonderful God, and there is always a remnant, and we need to be looking at what is our responsibility in this moment. We're not called to be the pundit who calls the outcome of this particular episode. Um, we are called to be faithful to what we've been given to do here and now, and that is a reason for optimism when we are uh, pursuing that calling with the interest of our, serving our fellow man and glorifying God. Well, I'm very grateful for your time this afternoon, Jennifer. But Steve, just as we are winding up now, uh, you have classrooms uh, with 20-somethings, people that are preparing to step off the campus here at Ligonier and Reformation Bible College uh, into this new public square. If you were addressing them now, uh, what would you say to them as young Christians at the beginning of their careers? Uh, do they have hope? What is, what is their hope as a Christian? Nathan, I'd tell them two stories. Uh, one is from church history. So as Rome was falling, you know, this is early years, decades of the 400s, we have an example in two people. Jerome, who was a great scholar uh, and behind the, the Vulgate and then a brilliant scholar, when he saw the collapse of Rome, he literally pulled the chicken little thing and the sky is falling. And he said, ah, the beloved city is in ruins. We are done. And he goes and lives in a cave in Bethlehem, thinking this is the end of the world. And he spent his last year in a cave in Bethlehem. Uh, I think he miscalculated that it was the end of the world. Uh, Augustine, on the other hand, seeing the same things, he writes a book and he writes City of God. And he uses City of God, the sack of Rome, to remind us of where our citizenship is. But he also, in the City of God, helps us as citizens of the City of God to live in the City of Man. So we don't go into a cave and just wait out to the end of the world. We need to live as the citizens of heaven in this world. The second thing I'd go to, you know, Israel had a crisis moment in its life too. It was about to be taken by the Assyrians, and we've got this great biblical text, and here comes Israel, and they thought they had it together, and we have this text that reminds them that we're not to boast in our chariots. Uh, don't let the wise man boast in his wisdom. Don't let the mighty man boast in his might. But if you're going to boast, boast about this, right, that we know God and that we know his steadfast love, right? Our confidence must be in God, whether we lived in the old public square or the new public square. And once our confidence is in God, that answers the question. Yes, we have optimism. Well, that's such an appropriate place uh, for us to end our time this afternoon. Again, Jennifer, so thankful for you freeing up some time this afternoon and, and grateful for your work there in Capitol Hill. Thank you, and thank you for your ministry. And Steve, it's always a pleasure having you join us 
uh, for these theological conversations. So thank you. Uh, it's been my pleasure, and I've just thoroughly enjoyed uh, getting to hear Jennifer and just the good things that are happening there at Heritage and her work. Well, to those that are watching live, we are thankful that you've taken time out of your Friday afternoon uh, to participate live. Uh, we would like to remind you to visit ligonier.org slash events, and you can see all of the upcoming events that uh, Ligonier is doing, as well as when we announce uh, future live Google Hangouts such as today. You can also get Dr. Sproul's free ebook at ligonier.org slash church and state. And don't forget to visit heritage.org and, and see the work that Ms. Jennifer Marshall is doing there. Uh, I would like to remind you too that Dr. Nichols will be in Seattle for our West Coast Conference just over a month away, June 3 to 4. So if you're going to be on the West Coast or in Seattle, make sure you register uh, and see uh, Steve Nichols there. Uh, and I'll also be joined by Tim Challies for a special pre-conference looking at uh, Christians living in the digital world. Along Nathan W. Bingham, and may you continue to grow in your knowledge of God and His holiness.